What are the climate proxies? Which proxies scientists use to figure out the climate of the past? How can we use chemistry to figure out the history of Earth's climate? Let's talk about that. Climatologists, geologists, geographists, Earth scientists use gay chemistry to understand the path of our planet climate. We call it proxies. To understand how it works, how reliable those proxies are, and how much we can reconstruct into the past of what happened with our atmosphere, temperature, water on our planet, we should understand how scientists use gear chemistry. First of all, we need to look in the periodic table. Periodic table contains all the elements you can find right now on our planet or even outside in our visible universe. Assuming the basic physics law apply outside of our touchable universe. By touchable, I mean the universe we can actually touch, try, taste, open up, split up, and look under the microscope. We can speculate as much as we can about what's happening on other planets or in space, but the only several samples from other planets we have on our Earth right now. So everything we speculate about outer space will be purely theoretical. However, some meteorites and some probes from Mars or Moon give us some information about physics law around the whole universe. So we can fairly trust the same physics law apply. In the periodic table, you find all elements of our universe. And of course, the simpler the elements, the more abundant they are, because it's harder for nucleus of atoms to preserve the more complex they are. That's for the most common element in our universe will be helium, hydrogen. So what are the elements? Elements are defined by the number of protons in the nucleus. What are the protons? Protons used to be thought the most fine part of the everything we can see around us. The finer part of our material which we cannot split anymore. However, recent nuclear physicists proved that we can actually split the atom and even we can split the protons as well and they're composed of quarks. But you should look and study the nuclear physics to understand how it works. Here we're just focusing on the fact that all elements are composed of protons. And actually the element will be defined by the number of the protons which is stable. For example, hydrogen has one proton. Its atomic mass is one. And if you will have two or more protons, it will be a different element. In the nucleus of all elements, we also have neutrons. Neutrons, it's less charged and less weight part of the atom, the fine particle of the atom, which is less consistent for our elements. And it will vary. For example, hydrogen could be composing only from one proton, or the nucleus of the hydrogen can compose of one proton and one neutron. It will be still hydrogen, but will be less stable hydrogen. We call it deuterium, and commonly we use letter D to identify that. Therefore, you can say that hydrogen have two isotopes, one and two. But what does it mean in the physical world? And what does it mean for us in terms of climate? How can we use these properties? It would mean that the water, which has hydrogen in its molecules, will have two types of molecules, one with hydrogen 1 and other molecules with hydrogen 2. And because the hydrogen 2 molecules will be twice heavier, they're less active, as you might say, because they're heavier, it takes more energy for them to vibrate, rotate and spin. It means the hydrogen 1 will sustain longer in the colder temperatures. Therefore, in a cloud in our atmosphere, with a high temperature, both hydrogen's molecules with 1 and hydrogen 2 will vibrate quite fast. Hydrogen 1, 1 will be a little bit faster vibrating and spinning and shaking in the atmosphere. However, if you start reducing the temperature, the molecules with hydrogen 2 or deuterium become heavy and more reluctant when hydrogen 1 will still preserve the rotational, vibrational energy and the spin. Therefore, 
we can look on proportion of hydrogen 1 and hydrogen 2 in particular time in the atmosphere and you can figure out the change of the temperature at the time. That's how we use geochemistry to identify the climate change in the past. This is just example with the hydrogen. These are all other elements in our periodic table have isotopes. Another very common element, a little bit heavier than the hydrogen, will be oxygen. And you heard about oxygen 16, oxygen 17, oxygen 18. Oxygen 16, oxygen 17, it's a fairly stable oxygen. We call them stable isotopes. 16 oxygen has 8 protons and 8 neutrons in its nucleus. Oxygen 17 has 8 protons and 7 neutrons, but it's still accounted to be stable. It's very hard to separate those protons from neutrons in its atom, in its nucleus, and we count it as a stable one. The oxygen 18 has 8 protons and 10 neutrons. Each of the elements on our planet has these isotopes which are radioactive. Radioactive, it means it will decay. Those neutrons will fall apart with time. Many elements on our planet have this radioactivity and with time they start separate under the influence of the cosmic ray which constantly bombarding these molecules, the nucleus. They change the number of protons and nucleus and they become stable. We talked about that, how we use these radioactive or unstable isotopes in the video about geological dating. Please check it out this video. Here we're interested in stable isotopes, not unstable, like I'll be interested if I want to date stuff. I want to look on unstable isotopes, like carbon-14 and so on. For climate change, for understanding the climate in the past, I will look for the stable isotopes proportions. Scientists find the other way to look on periodic table to understand these dependencies and pinpoint the isotopes. For example, you see on this table, we're plotting protons against neutrons numbers in our nucleus of particular elements. You can see in gray color will be those stable isotopes and white those who have too many neutrons and they will be unstable or radioactive. So essentially the most stable or in balance atoms will be those which in proportion one to one neutrons to protons. Number of protons always stay the same for a particular element, it's stable. If you change number of the proton, you change the element. So hydrogen becomes helium, for example. Otherwise, we will look on the neutrons, which are vary, and it will change your isotope, which we talked before. Let's have a look on this example. Non-shaded squares will be those radioactive or, or atoms which are in imbalance. They will have any opportunity to lose the neutrons and they will do so. We can't do anything about it. That's the law of the nature. Everything wants to be in a balance, positive and negative. On the hydrogen, you can see a very good example. Number one, we have one proton. This is the element of hydrogen. One proton will throw out through all isotopes. But in the first hydrogen, you don't have any neutrons. And it's a very stable atom. Next, hydrogen 2 will have one proton, one neutron. You can assume it's very stable as well. Next, hydrogen 3. Hydrogen 3 will have one proton, because it's still hydrogen, but two neutrons. And one of those neutrons will look for any opportunity to disintegrate from this unstable atom. It will just not have enough forces to stay within the atom. We call it radioactive. In geology, people use it to date the groundwater. Similarly, you will look for oxygen, 16, 17, 18. Carbon, we talked about carbon 14, it's unstable, radioactive. But carbon 12 and 13 will be stable. In my climate science, as a proxy, I will use stable isotopes. And I will discard the radioactive, because they will change. And that's how scientists use elements in isotopes to understand the changes of the climate in the past, changes of the physical properties 
of the environment. So essentially, we can sum up that all the elements which are radioactive, they are in, in balance of the protons and neutrons, and they become active. And they will be active till they will find the stability when they will lose the neutrons and they become balanced or stable again. However, we have those stable isotopes in the environment all the time. And it's all based on thermodynamic related to vibrational energy of molecules as they move through the Earth system. In the future videos, we talk about particular examples which isotopes we use for particular cases. In a climate study, hydrogen or oxygen, how people core in their ice in Antarctica, and by looking by the difference of isotopes of oxygen, figure out the temperature change in the past, or using carbon, which we find in organic sediments. There's a many application of this to our life and to understand the source from which environment organisms, plants or sediment originated, and to understand the conditions the time on the planet, temperature-wise, humidity-wise. Although it's all reference and you can't trust it as it is, but it can give you a fairly understanding of trends in the climate of the past.